After 214 years of self-imposed near-isolation, Japan was forced to open in 1853. New trade technology and ideas flooded the nation, and by the end of the next decade, the old order was supplanted in the Meiji Restoration, and a new government was established, promising civilization and enlightenment, as well as the creation of a Europeanized nation in Asia. The new leadership pronounced a legally undifferentiated citizenry who could all own private property, who all must pay taxes, who all could be conscripted, and who all had to attend school. These were significant changes in themselves, but for many, they didn't go far enough. Informed by recent Western political theory, a movement for popular rights formed in Japan and sought political change through activism. Among the reformists was one man with a deep belief in the power of ideas who would write a discourse that could well have changed the course of history. This man was Nakaya Tokusuke, better known by his pen name, Chomin, which translates to a trillion people, a hint to where his political commitments lie. Chomin was born in 1847 to a low-ranking samurai and received a traditional Japanese education in his youth. Then, at the age of 15, he began to study Chinese, English, Dutch, and then later on French at a newly founded institution for Western learning. After his education, he worked as an interpreter for the French diplomatic delegation, where he was selected to work and study in France in 1871. Chomin would spend three years in France, studying language, politics, and philosophy, even beginning his translation of Jean-Jacques Rousseau's Social Contract. After the exchange group was called back to Japan, Chomin would establish a French academy, continue translating, and co-found a newspaper. Although he would keep distance from the popular rights movement itself for a time, Chomin supported the push for liberty, rights, democracy, and egalitarianism indirectly. His own magazine included a translation of the Declaration of the Rights of Man in its first issue, and a new translation of the social contract with explanations, blending in Confucian terminology and values to appeal to fellow Japanese thinkers. Before Chomin, the reformist movement was ideologically dominated by the British liberal tradition, particularly John Locke and John Stuart Mill. But Chomin's work with French philosophers would form an ideological basis for the second wing of the liberal movement, and would gain Chomin the nickname, the Rousseau of the East. Yet, by 1885, the two wings of the popular rights movement fractured, their political parties disbanded, and public support for the movement was declining as a whole. Political parties in Japan seemed destined for a political graveyard. At this exact time, Meiji leadership had begun drafting what would become the nation's first written constitution. So on the eve of the reformists' greatest opportunity to change the very organization of the Japanese government, the movement was in shambles. Seeing this, Chomin could no longer simply support from the sidelines. He would join others in organizing meetings, reunifying the movement, but Chomin's greatest support for the movement came in a manner that was much more his style. An attempt to merge political idealism with practical politics, to unify and reinvigorate the reformist movement. It was, of course, his most influential work. A Discourse by Three Drunkards on Government, published in 1887. The discourse begins by introducing Nankai Sensei, or Master Nankai, a character that Chomin's most famous student, Kotoku Shusui, described as Nankai's own self-portrait. Like Nankai Chomin, Nankai Sensei found his greatest pleasures in drinking and talking politics. One night, already a bit drunk, two guests arrive at Nankai's house, bringing conversation and even more alcohol. Nankai Sensei doesn't bother learning their names, probably because he doesn't need to. The two are both easy enough to identify, in thought, appearance, and mannerisms. He calls one the gentleman of Western learning. The gentleman has a slim body, dresses in European-style clothing, and prefers to march forward along the straight line of logic, rather than the winding path of reality. Nankai calls the other one the champion of the East. The champion is tall with thick arms, he wears a traditional hakama, and has a love for grandeur, adventure, and fame. The three characters together represent and exaggerate the diverse range of peoples and ideas that were part of the now fractured reformist movement. Chomin places them in cheerful dialogue, with plenty of time and alcohol to share their ideas and voice their suggestions for the future of Japan. As a member of the popular rights movement himself, we might expect to hear Chomin's voice expressed through one of the characters. The most obvious candidate for this would be Nankai Sensei, a near mirror image of Chomin himself. And indeed, Nankai expresses a pragmatic tendency in Chomin's thought, but it would be a mistake to take Nankai to be the sole reflection of Chomin's voice throughout the work. The gentleman and the champion, although exaggerations, also reflect parts of Chomin's own thought, as we'll see, and they could similarly be reflections of Chomin's contradictory dispositions. In the Champion of the East, we might see Chomin as the son of a samurai learned in the Confucian tradition, 
and in the gentleman of Western learning, we might see Chomin as a student of politics and philosophy studying in France. Thus, the discourse is not only a simulated dialogue amongst divided reformists, but also the inner discourse of Chomin himself, whose own desires and ideals conflict with each other and with his newfound pragmatic concerns. The discourse then is a window into Chomin's own splintered mind. The gentleman begins the discussion, calling for Japan to adopt liberal democracy immediately, remove aristocratic rankings, and turn the government over to the people. To support this, he references a god of evolution that determines the course of history. This god of evolution is adopted from the social Darwinism of Herbert Spencer. The theory that those biological theories of evolution, natural selection, and survival of the fittest held for political, social, and economic realms. Despite being discredited in modern times and rightly criticized for the historical injustices it was used to support, reformist ideologues in Japan at the time were almost unanimous in subscribing to Spencer's social Darwinism, although, as we'll see, they disagreed over what social Darwinism meant for the future of Japan. According to one scholar, Meiji intellectual history could be written as Spencer v. Spencer. In the discourse, the gentleman's god of evolution has already determined the course of history a progression through several stages of social and political organization. Humanity originally existed in anarchy and chaos, until groups banded together under aristocratic militarism, sacrificing their rights and liberties for security. The gentleman adopts this part of the process for Rousseau, as expected from a character crafted by Chomi. From here, Spencer's social Darwinism would posit that a society progresses from aristocratic militarism towards the universal establishment of democracy. But Chomin has the gentleman at an intermediate stage, constitutional monarchism, wherein the people don't win their rights but have them granted by the monarch. As the gentleman presents it, the god of evolution is a purely deterministic process, with no room for active interference. Every society moves through these stages at its determined pace. But the gentleman makes an exception for Asia. In Japan, he believes that man could accelerate the process, skip constitutional monarchy, and establish democracy right then and there. And luckily for the gentleman, this wouldn't require rebellion or the use of force, both of which he, like Chomin, ardently opposed because the new constitution sat on the horizon. Here the gentleman is interrupted by the champion, who raises the central question of international politics. What is the gentleman's Japan to do if a strong western nation were to attack? The gentleman takes issue with the question itself. His international stance revolves around his domestic stance. Democracy itself, he says, is a deterrent to war. If the people are in charge, they will not decide to go to war, because it is always the people who bear the burden of war, and never the rulers themselves. Once every nation has democracy, few would be willing to fight, and nations would come together to form a peaceful world order within international government. And even if Japan is alone in pioneering democratic rulership, as the gentleman would like, it would be an example for the West to look up to, rather than to attack. And in the off chance that Japan is invaded, the gentleman, holding strong to the pacifist tradition, thinks that Japan shouldn't defend itself, because any fighting, even fighting back, is immoral. The gentleman would have Japan gamble on virtue. The gentleman's unwavering pacifism was out of the ordinary for Meiji thinkers. With the fear of Western aggression pervasive throughout Japan, most preferred to build up strength rather than remain in relative weakness. The champion of the East is the voice of this opinion in the discourse. Like the gentleman, the champion rests much of his position on Spencer's social Darwinism, but unlike the gentleman, he stresses a different part of Spencer's thought. Rather than emphasizing a societal theory of evolution, the champion brings out the theory of the survival of the fittest in the political realm. What this translates to is a realpolitik that sees strength alone as the decider in the international scene. If Japan was to stand on equal footing with Western powers, it needed equal strength. But Japan itself is small and comparatively lacking in population and resources. Thus, Meiji intellectuals agreed that it would require something beyond their borders. Some thought to create a unified front with China against the West, but most didn't. They didn't trust Chinese leadership and instead thought it should be the enlightened Japan who would lead the humiliated China. This, of course, leads into some hostile ideas, which we hear from the champion himself, who argues that, in order to compete with the colonial empires of the West, Japan ought to invade and rule from China, establishing a wealthy colonial empire of its own. However, the champion, likely restricted by Chomin, recognizes that the entire nation isn't behind this. In fact, he observes that the nation is divided, split into two. On the one hand, 
there are the lovers of novelty, like the gentlemen, who are typically younger, live in denser or more trafficked areas, and seek progress and westernization. On the other hand, there are the lovers of nostalgia, who are typically older, grew up in more rural and remote areas, and join the reformist movement out of dissatisfaction with the westernization at the beginning of the Meiji period. As reductionist as it may sound, the champion was pointing out a genuine divide in the nation. Until Japan opened up in 1854, the primary purpose of schooling was for the training of budding samurai. But with the reforms, all of those with a traditional education, including Chomin in his younger years, had not just their vocation, but their way of life upended. The champion and his lovers of nostalgia yearned for earlier times, but more than the return of traditional Japanese society, the champion desires glory and victory or dignity in death. But he recognizes that the lovers of nostalgia are only a portion of the nation, and admits that driving Japan to war for their sake would be irresponsible and would impede the inevitable emergence of democracy. In a moment of self-deprecation, the champion analogizes the lovers of nostalgia to a cancer in the body of the nation. This leads the champion to propose a win-win situation for both sides of the nation. He suggests that all the lovers of nostalgia should band together, leave Japan for good, and invade China on their own. As unrealistic and illiberal as this may sound, it isn't too far from Chomin's own ideas. Chomin supported private adventurism, like that scene with Charles Gordon in North Africa, but only so long as there was a clear distinction between private adventurism and national policy. Having made their arguments, the two guests clear the floor for their host, the master. In this way, the structure of the discourse is clearly borrowed from the long-established Buddhist and Confucian dialogue format, whereby a master, in conversation with his students, steers them towards a superior and explicit conclusion. But, in this rambling work of his, Chomin subverts the literary tradition with a master that's hands-off until the end. Up to this point, Nankai-sensei has done little more than fill the drinks of his guests. But urged on by the gentleman and the champion, Nankai shares his views, shaped by Chomin's newfound pragmatism. Nankai-sensei begins by criticizing the two for being unrealistic in their judgments of the political conditions in Japan and in the world. First, Nankai doesn't disagree with the gentleman's ideals, he disagrees with the timing. The gentleman had no regard for the practicality of bringing democracy to Japan, but if he had been realistic, he would have seen that Japan wasn't yet ready for full-fledged democracy. Liberal democratic ideals had only just begun to permeate through Japan, and to bring about a form of government at a time when the people are not yet ready for it is certain to bring calamity because, central to Chomin's own thought, the institutions of a nation, that is, the state of social Darwinian evolution that a society is at, be it anarchy, democracy, or anything in between, is shaped by the ideas in the minds of the people. This theory solves the contradiction in the gentleman's thought between liberal activism and the belief in a deterministic history. A nation's historical stage is determined by the people. Thus, activism that changes the minds of the people can alter the speed of historical progress. Furthermore, by asserting the power of ideas and principles, the theory affirms the importance of the ideologist, like Chomin himself, who helps mold those ideas and principles. As for the champion, Nankai-sensei criticizes him for exaggerating the threat of Western imperialism in Asia. Japan's military strength might not compare to the strongest of the Western powers, but Nankai doesn't see that as much reason to worry. The balance of power will keep those nations at bay, he says. They all have their eyes on each other. In fact, the only way a war would break out between Japan and one of those nations is if fear and mutual suspicion consumed the people, distorting their sense of reality and causing one side to attack the other, under the assumption that it was under threat. After receiving their criticisms, the gentleman and the champion ask Nankai-sensei for his own opinion. What would he do to secure the future of Japan? Nankai's answer is realistic, moderate, and, to his guests, underwhelming. He advocates for improved relations with China and the creation of a bicameral legislature under a constitutional monarchy with one house elected by the aristocracy and one house elected by the people. In this case, the people wouldn't have earned their rights but would have them bestowed, and Nankai-sensei saw no effective difference between the two. Should Japan ever be attacked, Nankai says that Japan must defend itself with all its might, and leaves it at that. With this answer, the guests laugh in amusement at how commonplace the master's position really is. And the discourse on government ends there, but the three drunkards continue to laugh and drink together until dawn. Then his guests take their leave. The gentleman heads to North America, the champion goes to Shanghai, and Nankai-sensei writes the discourse and, as always, keeps on drinking. Despite not having a clear dogmatic position to make a comprehensive and compelling argument for, 
I'd say that the discourse was not without purpose. On my view, Chomin had a few goals in writing it. First, to bring people's attention to the question of Japan's future, which he thought they had a say in. Second, to educate the people on contemporary debates in politics in an indirect and accessible way. And third, to unify the reformist movement towards a moderate position. So how did it do? Upon its publishing in 1887, unlike numerous other political writings of the time, the text wasn't censored at all and was successfully distributed to the people. This required careful crafting from Chomin. The discourse made no references to the reformist movement itself, didn't criticize the government, and concluded with a position of compromise. I'd made no point of it before, but those times when the champion advocated invading China, he never named China itself, referring instead to a large nation to the West, currently under poor leadership. Without censorship, the text was widely popular and well received, and not just within the movement itself, but in the broader public. And although it evaded contentious specifics, the dialogue was no doubt incredibly enlightening on leading political theories, on the reformist movement, and on Japan's options for the future, making Chomin's first two goals sound like a success. Unfortunately though, Chomin himself was not as lucky with government suppression as his work. In the same year the discourse was released, Chomin, along with hundreds of other reformists, was banished from Tokyo for dissension. This proved to be only a minor detour for Chomin, whose third goal was achieved just a couple years later, when the Meiji constitution was promulgated, organizing the government largely as Nankai Sensei had suggested. A bicameral legislature was formed, with public elections deciding the lower house. At the first election in 1890, Factions from both sides of the previous reformist divide came together to form the Constitutional Liberal Party, which would win the most seats of any party and form a parliamentary majority with other liberal parties in the first diet. Of course, Japanese international policy didn't heed Nankai Sensei's cautious advice, expanding its sphere of influence in the first Sino-Japanese War, leading to the Russo-Japanese War a decade after that, not to mention the decades that followed. Chomin's success would continue for a short time after the discourse. He would be elected to return to Tokyo to represent Osaka and the Liberal Party in the first election in 1890, but his term was short-lived. After publishing an article about the lower house titled The Exhibition Hall of Bloodless Bugs, he handed in a resignation, giving his health and alcohol problem as the reason. In the time that followed, as he bounced between jobs in the private sector, Chomin kept up his study of ideas. He translated and explained Western works of philosophy, including Arthur Schopenhauer's book, The Two Fundamental Problems of Ethics. But he also did some philosophy of his own. In a work subtitled No God, No Soul, Chomin argued against the immortality of the spirit or soul. Chomin, a devout atheist and staunch materialist, found no grounds for the common belief that the body is a product of the soul, and, along with it, the belief that the soul continues after the material body dies. Instead, Chomin argued that it was the other way around. The spirit is really just an effect or operation emanating from the material body. Accordingly, the spirit doesn't continue on when the body perishes. When the body dies, the soul is extinguished. But at death, the material body isn't extinguished. Its functions cease, but its substance remains, going on to take a new form. So, on his argument, it isn't that the soul is immortal and the body is mortal. Rather, it's that the soul is mortal while the body is immortal. Chomin goes further to say that not only are the numerous philosophers who have argued otherwise wrong, be it Plato, Plotinus, or Descartes, but also unphilosophical in making the argument. Those philosophers have chosen comfort in the promise of the afterlife, and in so doing, they have left philosophy because the aim of philosophy is not convenience, nor is it to console. According to Chomin, a philosopher's duty and fundamental qualification is to be extremely dispassionate, extremely frank, extremely uncompromising. Those words, which may sound high and mighty, carry more weight when we take note that they were published just days before his own death, written in a two-volume work titled A Year and a Half, which he had took to writing after learning that he had terminal cancer. Chomin's convictions about the practice of philosophy were clearly strong. He thought that, no matter how pointless philosophy may appear, without it, a people will lack profound insight into what they are doing and cannot avoid superficiality. This reverence for philosophy played into what Chomin might be best known for, at least among students of Japanese philosophy. He once wrote, From ancient times to the present, philosophy has been absent in Japan. Over the years, there was religious thought and textual exegesis indeed, but this was not philosophy pure and simple. In his ardent atheism, Chomin saw philosophy as divorced from religious belief. This view would remain dominant outside of Japanese philosophy departments for about a decade. 
until Nishida Kitaro's An Inquiry into the Good appeared in 1911, blending philosophical and religious ideas into an original work of philosophy. Today, for many, An Inquiry into the Good is regarded as the first work of Japanese philosophy. Chomin, of course, didn't live to read it, because he had passed away a decade earlier, in 1901. Chomin, not just the Rousseau of the East, but the man of a trillion people, believed that ideas, especially in the minds of the people, could change the course of history, and then he proved it. Now his soul may be long gone and his material body dispersed, but his thought and influence remain, and in the spirit of Chomin and his discourse, I think we can all have a drink to that. But that's all I've got to talk about today. If you thought I got anything wrong or missed anything, then let me know what and why down below. As always, thanks for watching and until next time.